Uh, so I'm going to follow on from what Louise uh, talked about uh, to look at, for example, uh, the Creative Commons movement, which Louise and I are involved in, and also the concept of open educational resources. Um, I wanted to mention that for those of you on the Teaching with Technology course, which I think is open to everybody now, um, you can study that online. All UCC staff uh, will have received an all-exchange user's email saying that you can uh, do this uh, online course on teaching with technology. That has some references to copyright in it. Uh, I think it's in class five, the, the fifth class on the list. Um, and uh, I, I just reproduce here one aspect of it. It's, a, it's an excellent course developed by Epigium. And uh, they uh, ask people to reflect on some of the issues which might arise for them in their teaching and to consider whether some of these statements are true or false. Now I won't go through each of them, but uh, to take an, an example, um, say the fourth one down there talks about, although I am using an image for which I have not gained rights permissions, this is not illegal if I am only using it in the institutional VLE. So it gets people to think uh, the virtual learning environment is Blackboard in UCC, or some people use Moodle, I think. Um, it, it, it gets people to think about possible misconceptions they may have about copyright. Uh, and the short answer is that um, even if you're using it within the institutional VLE, you still have to consider copyright issues and whether you have permission or not. Um, it's either covered by the license, or, or if it's not covered by the license, then uh, you are breaching copyright even though it's, it's in an institutional context. Uh, so there are true, true and false answers to each of these, but I just wanted to remind those of you doing the course that, 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 um, that that's there. And if you're not registered for the course, it's easy to, to do it. And Patrick can, can provide you with the details. Um, now, the reason I mentioned the open educational resources movement is that um, it's useful to be aware that some academics are moving away from the idea of copyright protecting their work at all um, and, and deciding to share it more with the, with the world. Um, and this is encouraged, for example, by UNESCO uh, as part of, uh, development, of the development agenda that, uh, that universities and other educators can actually make their material available and apply very liberal licenses of various kinds to it. And so there's a whole movement out there where, which, which is expressly waiving copyright uh, with an eye, as Louise says, as opposed to waiving. Uh, so uh, it's a movement that I think you should be aware of. And you could consider, for example, sometimes making your work available under those kinds of licenses rather than um, under copyright. Now, sometimes, of course, you've no choice. If you want to publish a book with a reputable publisher, you normally have to uh, sell the copyright. Um, but you know, there's a whole movement towards open access publishing um, uh, and, and so on. And it's all part of this general uh, agenda. Um, you may have heard of uh, sites such as MIT OpenCourseWare uh, and so on, where very reputable universities are making lectures available for free, online courses of various types. Uh, you also have these things called massive open online courses, or MOOCs, or MOOCs, uh, where uh, thousands and thousands of people can participate in a course. And uh, the, the most famous one there is Coursera, which uh, offers uh, lots of uh, interesting courses for citizens. Um, in Ireland, uh, we have a thing called the National Digital Learning Resources website, which I'll talk about briefly in a minute. I have a screenshot of two sites. Firstly, the Coursera one, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. And in the corner there, it talks about joining 1,800,000 Coursereans. So uh, that means that there are 800,000 members of this site who have um, taken part in courses of various type, or at least registered to take part in courses. So the scale is massive of these operations. Uh, and uh, it's encouraging people to do courses such as a course on algorithms from Stanford University, which is available for free and online to anybody in the world who wants to do it. Um, 
Now, in Ireland, we have the National Digital Learning Resources site. Um, and I, I was looking around it uh, over the last few days, and um, it's supported by the HEA. So I think all the universities and the IOTs are, are members of, of the site. Uh, and uh, they, the, the concept behind it is that if people want to share learning materials with, with the rest of the world, uh, they can do that through this site. Um, now, the license terms vary from depending on the material, so it, it, isn't open a, it isn't all open access. If you look at a particular item, it may <coughs> actually say that it is copyright um, and that it may not be reused. It, it can perhaps only be viewed on the site. So you have to check for each individual item. Uh, but, but it's certainly a source for reusable material, perhaps in, in people's modules. And also, it's an idea for academics to consider that they can provide resources into systems like this. Um, I found one, uh, the search, um, you can't search by institution. I wanted to find a Cork example, you know, because we're so insular. Uh, uh, I'm not even a Cork man myself, but I, it's my adopted home. So. Uh, I did, I found an example and then I, by accident I discovered that it was actually a Cork example because the fir first name Francis Burke is actually Frank Burke in the dental hospital, or the hospital which has a dental dimension to it. So, uh, so it's, uh, I think it's a collaboration with, other, with people in other universities. But it's a, it's a video um, related to dental science. And, uh, it, has, it is licensed under a Creative Commons license. So it has the kind of standard license, if you're, it's a standard layout. If you're familiar with Cora, um, which concerns articles, uh, this has a similar layout, but it's not just about documents. Although a lot of the material is actually PDFs. Um, if you're looking for visual material, uh, it seems to be that, it seemed to me from the browsing around I've done that uh, it, it, the number of, of visual materials of items of visual material is quite low. Um, and I don't think you can actually search by type of material either, but that's another story. You know, these are just minor things which can, will be resolved over time. You can't search by institution and you can't search by type in, of material. Um, but anyway, this has a Creative Commons license applied to it, and then you have the MPG file. And I checked, you can download that. You don't have to register with the site in order to download it either. I wondered, would that be the case? I think I actually have an account with that site, um, but I didn't have to log in in order to view the video. You can download it and you can view it. Um, now, it's actually only a four minute video, so in terms of quantity, it's, uh, it's not massive. But in, in principle, it's an interesting uh, development. Um, the, so to explain then Creative Commons for people who aren't familiar with it, uh, the Creative Commons is a non-profit corporation based in California. and uh, it, it, it's founded on the idea that people may not want to actually reserve all their intellectual property rights. They may actually want to reserve some of them, uh, and, but give some of them away. And it's to give them an easy way of doing that. They may wish to share their work, um, and, uh, but still retain the copyright. So it, it is actually founded on copyright. It, it's not opposed to copyright. Uh, it, um, it's sometimes criticized as being anti-copyright, but uh, it would say in response that, in fact, uh, it depends for its existence on the existence of copyright law. Um, but, you know, politically it's regarded as, as, as kind of somewhat lefty, so to speak, in, in um, simplistic terms, uh, because it talks about sharing and so on. Um, so, uh, UCC Law Faculty, in the form of Louise and I, uh, is the Irish partner in Creative Commons. So there is now an Irish license available. Um, so if you are licensing work uh, on the Creative Commons site, you can actually choose that the Irish version apply uh, to, to the license. Um, so I have a screenshot here. If you go into the Creative Commons site and you um, go to their license chooser, um, it asks you various questions. So the first question is, do you want to allow modifications of your work or not by, by subsequent users? And you answer yes or no to that. Um, another question is whether you want to allow commercial uses of your work. And one thing to bear in mind in the university context is that some of, of the things, of course, that we do, do have a commercial 
uh, dimension. So, for example, um, if we run a CPD event, as we call them, a continuing professional development event, uh, uh, there, an argument could easily be constructed that that, that is a commercial event, in fact. You know? uh, so, uh, one can't always assume that everything we do is educational. Um, if we're making a, a specific profit from the activity, um, it isn't necessarily purely educational. Um, or we might have, you know, you, you might have some kind of summer school where, where people pay large sums of money to attend, and it's not part of the core kind of educational uh, function of the university. So there, there can be issues there. Um, but as I say, as you see in the screenshot, I've selected the licensed jurisdiction as Ireland, um, and that, that, as I say, is now possible. It is important to be aware that even if you choose the licensed jurisdiction as Ireland, your work will, of course, be viewed. Uh, throughout the world if you're making it available on the web um, and so litigation could occur anywhere in the world about it uh, and the Irish license doesn't actually say that the litigation must take place in Ireland or indeed even that Irish law will apply um, so it's actually an international license with an Irish flavor to it um, and in fact in version 4.0 of the Creative Commons licenses which was, which is currently being drafted uh, there will no longer be regional licenses, so we just got in on time uh, because we have been working on it for a number of years. Um, we, we now have an Irish license, but when version 4.0 comes out, uh, that will be international. Uh, the, one of the reasons they're doing that is that they only had national licenses for a small number of countries, a relatively small number of countries. Um, and it would have been a massive amount of work to actually get licenses in every country in the world. So they decided to move away from the idea of regional licenses, or, or national licenses indeed. Um, but the Irish license will still exist, you know, even when 4.0 has been adopted, uh, let's say next year. Um, people can still license work under 3.0, and there will still be work out there which is licensed under 3.0, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, once you've made your various choices, you then uh, get the categorization of the license. And this is explained um, a little bit on the next slide. Um, there are um, about six categories of license. There are other ones which aren't listed here, like there's a public domain uh, and so on. But the main ones are these six here. And, uh, in all of them, there must be attribution. So if a person reuses your material, they must um, acknowledge th that it came from the original author. Uh, the next one then is attribution non-commercial, that um, th the author must be acknowledged, and, but the item must not be used for commercial use. Attribution share alike, if it is reused, um, the, the same terms must be applied to the subsequent reuser the same license terms. No derivatives is another uh, dimension to it, that, that you don't allow adaptations uh, or changes to your item. Uh, and then combinations which involve three uh, aspects further down the list. Uh, so it is a little bit confusing and it is one of the <coughs> criticisms of the Creative Commons um, licenses that um, that it, it, it may actually lead to what they call a proliferation of licenses. Um, there are other licenses which don't have so many options in them. But Creative Commons would say in response that uh, the, the whole idea is to provide a more nuanced set of choices to people. Um, so as part of that, there has to be a certain amount of complication to deal with the myriad of um, options which a person might want to exercise. Uh, so it's giving people freedom to choose. That's a, a more benign way of looking at what might be criticized as being complicated. Um, so the, the abbreviations can, can be a bit confusing, but if you are just are aware that it always begins with by, and that just means attribution, that you want it to be known that it's by somebody. And then the other abbreviations either mean non-commercial, no derivatives, or share alike. Um, then uh, you can actually look then for Creative Commons images. Say you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, um, and you think that you may use it in the future. Like I, I've found in the last few years um, that if, even if I'm doing something for a class, 
I think, well, you know, I might use this slide later in a conference, and that conference might be commercial, and also it might be put up on the web afterwards. So, uh, to my mind, if I'm looking for something of which there are thousands of pictures on the internet, I might as well find a Creative Commons one at the outset, so that then I don't have to worry anymore if I ever reuse it in the future. So that's the mentality which I've adopted in recent years. I still have lots of old slides which have images from Google Images and so on where, where the copyright um, is, uh, is, um, is, is still held. And so, you know, if I were to use those in a, a more public forum, I'd have to get permissions and so on. But from now on, you could consider looking for Creative Commons photos where possible or Creative Commons material where possible. So say if you go to Flickr, for example, um, uh, you, uh, I have step one there is that you can press explore on the home page and then a menu comes up and you'll see Creative Commons comes up. Um, so this is giving you a practical example of how to find uh, images which are Creative Commons licensed. Then this page comes up and uh, you can see the attribution license has 36 million photos in it. So what I normally do actually is I choose the attribution one. Uh, the reason being that it's the freest of the six. Um, you don't have to worry about the commercial dimension. You don't have to worry about derivatives. You know, like what if you change this photo even slightly? You know, could you get into trouble or whatever? So I, all you have to worry about is attribution. So I normally choose from those 36 million. You know, it's, it's enough choice for me. Um, uh, then, uh, you, you, uh, on the previous one, I had pressed, um, you can, uh, when you say see more, I pressed see more on that, um, and you get a search box. So I take an example of an iPad. Say you want to put a picture of an iPad into your slides or whatever. Um, so I search for iPad, um, and I get a load of pictures of iPads, and this is only the first page. Um, it doesn't show the number there, but there was some massive number of pictures of iPads, all of which were Creative Commons licensed. Uh, so you, you have a huge choice, you know, you just pick one that you like, and then you, when you save it, um, be sure to, what I always do is, I, in the file name, I put the name of the author from Flickr, uh, and the fact that it is Creative Commons licensed, so that for myself, I know for the future, um, that that is the case. Um, you can also use an advanced search on Flickr rather than going through the explore option that I used. You can actually uh, go into advanced search and as one of the options say that you only want to look for Creative Commons content and you can make various choices there as well. Um, um, another thing too to be aware of is that you can actually download the pictures. You don't have to take a screenshot of the picture. I was talking to somebody one day and he said he doesn't use Flickr, he uses Google Images because in Flickr you can't download the pictures. And I said, you can. And he said, no, you can't. And, you know the way that kind of tit for tat develops. And, uh, but the problem is I realized when I actually started to write down the steps that it's not actually totally obvious how you do it. You have to actually go actions, view all sizes. Even under actions, I don't think download actually appears straight away. You have to go actions, view all sizes, and then once you choose the size that you want, download appears. Um, you may also need to be logged in already. I'm not sure about that um, uh, because I was logged in when I was testing this. Um, but of course, you could take a screenshot as well, you know, um, if you have, have some um, screenshot package. Um, Bearing in mind that you're not breaching any license here because the person has a Creative Commons licensed it. Um, so that's a practical example of how to do it. Um, and, and you have a huge choice there of images. Now, obviously, as regards video, you can go to YouTube, and YouTube has a Creative Commons um, aspect to it as well. So you can look for Creative Commons material uh, on that. Um, and in, in in the advanced search, as far as I know. Um, in Google advanced search, um, there is a usage rights section as well. So you can search for whatever you're looking for and say that you want only Creative Commons material. In Google Images advanced search as well. And there are various repositories. Um, some of you may have heard of Europeana, for example, which is um, a repository, a European funded repository of uh, photographs and videos and so on. Uh, from throughout Europe. 
There's also a, a page at Creative Commons called search.creativecommons.org. It's not actually a search engine, but it, it refers you on to major sites such as Flickr and Google and so on, where you can find um, material which is Creative Commons licensed. So because Creative Commons has been around for quite a while now, it's, it's quite well established, the amount of material which is Creative Commons licensed uh, is massive. Uh, so once you've chosen your Creative Commons licensed work, it's important to attribute it properly. Um, because remember, all of them require attribution. Um, so you can, you can just have small print, you know, lawyers love small print. You can have small print in your slide. Um, so in this version here of uh, a slide on SlideShare, on the site slideshare.com, um, the person has uh, put the, the note in the small print. Now you might say, well, that's too small to be legible, so that's not lawful. But on SlideShare, you can actually download a PDF, which allows you to expand it up to the size that you need. So a person who wants to conscientiously find out exactly who took this picture uh, can easily do so. Um, and I just magnified it then. I downloaded the PDF of the um, slideshow, and there you see the actual text where the author, Judy O'Connell, I think, who did the slide share, she's attributing it to Martina, Martina K. 15 at Flickr. Um, so she, she says that it's CC licensed, brackets by, in other words, that it's an attribution license, um, so it can be used for commercial purposes and so on. Uh, and then she gives the URL where the photograph was originally sourced. Um, Another way of doing it is to have a credit section at the end of your slides. Um, so Matthias Klang, for example, on SlideShare, um, he, he does that. Uh, and what he does, in fact, is that he doesn't even give the full <coughs> credits. He just tells you where you can find the credits, um, that the images and licensing info are in the notes section of the slides. Um, and he also says how his PowerPoint is licensed as well. Um, OK, so th that's just a practical way of finding Creative Commons material. Then I wanted to mention the Copyright Review Committee paper. Um, this was issued in, uh, in February 2012. It's an Irish report. The authors are Owen O'Dell of Trinity, Patricia McGovern, who's a solicitor in Dublin, and Professor Steve Headley from our own law department, or law faculty. Um, and. Uh, it raises various general questions about how the law might be reformed in Ireland. It's only a, a consultation paper, uh, so they haven't made firm proposals as such yet. But um, they talk, for example, uh, ab about some of the major questions, like whether copyright law inhibits uh, the work of innovation intermediaries, whether a broad concept of fair use should be adopted. Uh, that would be a more along the lines of the American model. Uh, but fair use, uh, broad concepts of fair use have, for example, been adopted in Israel and the Philippines. Um, so it's not just confined to America. It tends to be characterized as an American concept. Um, there are technical issues with adopting a broader fair use um, doctrine. Uh, in particular, it's not clear whether it's compatible with our EU obligations. So in the UK, they decided not to adopt a broad fair use exception in the Hargreaves report um, because uh, they had received legal advice that it wasn't actually possible. But the Irish paper suggests that since there are two sides of this argument, um, that it may actually be possible uh, that, that, that we could perhaps uh, try to take the side that in fact it is possible to adopt a broad doctrine of fair use within the EU directives. Um, and they raise other questions there, like whether the, all of the exceptions in the copyright directive should be incorporated into Irish law. The Irish list of exceptions uh, is somewhat limited, and there is scope under the directives to actually have further exceptions. Uh, and in general, they're proposing that we should ad uh, adopt as many of the exceptions as possible. Um, Louise talked about the education exceptions and the paper considers broadening the education exceptions. 
as Louise said, it, the exceptions were written um, at, at, at a time really before the digital age had, had exploded into the scale that it is now. Uh, and so they're, they're somewhat dated. So they suggest, for example, that the research or private study exception could be expanded to refer to education research or private study. Uh, that, that, because obviously education is different from research. Like if you're a primary school teacher, for example, you're not actually engaged in research in the strict sense. Um, uh, they also propose possible new sections on illustrations for education. There would actually be a special exception saying that you can actually um, show an illustration in education. Whereas at the moment, that's kind of implied in the way the section is drafted rather than it being absolutely explicit. Uh, an exception for distance learning, uh, although that's it's somewhat limited. Uh, they're not proposing a kind of a, a broad uh, exception on distance learning. But at least it would be an acknowledgement of the phenomenon of distance learning. Uh, and an exception for use by an educational establishment of work available through the internet, that, that would be a useful one, you know, uh, because we all tend to grab things off the internet. Uh, and at the moment, you know, w we would, strictly speaking, have to get permission for each grab. Um, so uh, it would be nice to have a, spe a special section saying, you know, if it's, if it's for education, uh, subject to certain parameters, that it's fine. Uh, they also talk about things like text mining and data mining. Um, as far as I understand this, for example, if you take text mining, the idea there would be that you might need to download, say, a thousand um, journal articles on something, even though it might, strictly speaking, be a breach of the license, the IRL license. But you, you might want to um, do some kind of analysis where you searched across the thousand uh, articles. Um, uh, and looked for patterns. Or similarly, you might download a thousand poems or something and look for every reference to, um, to fish or something in a thousand poems. And, uh, you know, you would, strictly speaking, be breaking the copyright. So you, you wouldn't then be able to write a journal article saying, I downloaded a thousand poems and I found the word fish 300 times or whatever. So uh, it, it would be useful to have a specific exception for what seems very reasonable, you know, in research terms. And similarly with data. Again, there's an open data movement as well, uh, which speaks about trying to make data more widely available and so that people can um, produce new graphics and so on about data and can link data. They can do things like, people do things like link um, the property registration authority data about prices of houses with map data, and you can do interesting things like that. So there would need to, however, to be certain exceptions to, to facilitate those um, activities, which are very legitimate um, re methods of research. Um, and on, on a somewhat related note, while I think of it, the, 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 the copyright protection, the fact that it lasts for 70 years after death, means that journal articles, for example, remain in copyright for very lengthy periods. And uh, that can inhibit um, academic research, um, including not just um, uh, legal research uh, and stuff that doesn't matter, but uh, also research which has very practical implications, like research into cures for diseases or whatever. Um, so the Hargreaves report, for example, in the UK, uh, stresses that universities are actually being hindered by copyright law in the research which they can carry out. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there needs to be more acknowledgement of the key role of universities in society. Um, now, of course, we're an interest group. We work in a university, so we would say that, wouldn't we, in a way? But uh, I, I found the language very interesting in the report that sometimes I think we're a bit shy about promoting the important work which is done in universities because we know that we're an interest group, if you know what I mean. Um, I also wanted to briefly mention, and this I think is the second last slide, uh, that uh, if you're interested in online education and licensing issues, that there's a free online course uh, which you can uh, register for at wikieducator.org. And uh, it's a, it's a course on open content licensing for educators. It's an international course. 
uh, Creative Commons are involved along with others. Um, and uh, apart from anything else, if you're not familiar with online education, it's useful to do some courses so that you get a feel for the kinds of things that can be done in online education, you know. Uh, there are also books and websites, uh, th like the key textbook in Ireland is Clark, Smith and Hall's Intellectual Property Law in Ireland, which is in the library. Um, and then there are various websites uh, which you can consult, obviously for the law, the actual text of the acts and so on. Um, and finally we can at last stop talking and uh, move on to discussion. I did try to put in some credits to try to practice what I preach. Uh, to uh, acknowledge the sources um, and to state the licenses where appropriate. And you can contact us on Twitter at, at those addresses given there.